from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for July 10th, 2020. Apparently this year hasn't been strange enough, so here we go. As if COVID-19 isn't bad enough, Russia and China are now dealing with an outbreak of the bubonic plague. Welcome back to the dark ages. Or how about this? A rare brain-eating amoeba is swimming around in the waters of Florida, and that can't be good for tourism. And this from NCIS, not the TV show, but the real Naval Investigative Agency, comes this directive to all U.S. sailors. Please don't buy your LSD online. Really. It's not like they can go to the dollar store and pick it up. And a Spaniard took his Zoom meeting attire to a whole new level. He listened to the meeting while showering, forgetting all the while he left the camera on. And finally, some University of Alabama students who are not Rhodes Scholars, are throwing COVID-19 parties. Now here's how that works. When you enter, you throw money into a bucket. You do not wear a mask. You don't worry about social distancing. And the first one that tests positive wins the bucket of money. Boy, that tuition money is well spent. On the podcast today, we have Kyle Tedding, Art Rothschild, and wrapping up the week, here's Bob Landis. Thanks, Max. Second week in a row, we made pretty good money. NASDAQ hit an all-time high this afternoon. Up 4% for the week, tacking on a stellar 410 points. NASDAQ closed this afternoon at 10,617. Meanwhile, in the broader markets, the S&P is up 1.8%, adding 55 points to close at 3,185, almost even for the year, down just four-tenths of a percent. Dow Jones Industrial Average up 1% this week, 247-point advance. We close at the bell this afternoon in New York with the Dow finishing the week. 26,075 points. Up again, up again, down again week. Market was up 459 points on Monday. It lost almost that amount, 396 points on Tuesday. Wednesday, up 177 points. Thursday, down 361. And today, the market up a nice 369 points to close out the week. Kyle, signs of economic activity rebounding has helped lift the markets. But now with virus cases on the rise in many parts of the country, people have recently become more cautious about getting back to normal activities. Recent data showed that consumer spending actually deteriorated in the second half of June. You and I touched on this last week on the show. Um, Looks like that we had a pretty good rebound second half of May into June, and now economic activity at best is starting to level off. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, we started to see case counts start to rise again, kind of near the the beginning to middle of June as well. And so, you know, you look at that economic data, May numbers coming off of April, uh, or early June numbers coming off of April and May, and things looked great. Again, it's a lot of month over month comparisons coming off of a couple of really bad months, in particular April, uh, it makes those comparisons look a lot better. When you look at it in the grand scheme of things, they're still pretty far behind where economic activity was expected to be. And then you bring in, uh, you know, I think the challenges of now record cases on Wednesday, uh, near record cases on Thursday, as you look at kind of the rolling seven-day averages. Um, And I think people are rightfully concerned about where we go from here. There's a, a lot of, you know, concern about do we need to close things back down again? And we've seen that in some states where bars were open, bars now closing down again. We've seen that in some states where uh, certain types of services were available that uh, aren't going to be available now. And so, you know, as we kind of uh, get through the last month or month and a half before the school year starts up again, I think, you know, people are very concerned about what the case counts look like as we get through the next you know, four to six weeks. And so encouraging to see the economic data pick up a little bit, but important to remember that that data is lagged. That data looks at kind of where we were sometimes, you know, some of the data we saw this week is still looking at May numbers. Um, And so, you know, I think we've got a a lot of work to do here still. Kyle, to underscore your point, the latest Wall Street Journal survey of economists released yesterday showed a slightly 
a more optimistic forecast, but 91% of economists surveyed said that the recovery depends on containing the virus, um, something that I think all of us knew. All right, let's bring you into the show. What's your take on current events? Uh, Bob, I think there's a lot of emphasis being placed on exactly the things you're talking about. Case, guys, case, uh, case numbers continue to rise. Um, the economic data continues to be mediocre at best. We are seeing improvements from some of the worst numbers in history, but there's still some of the worst numbers in history. So I've spent a lot of time this week explaining to my clients how to reconcile um, all of these concerns about the present and expected near future data with a market that continues to go higher. And I think the answer is what we've been giving on the show on a regular basis is the stock market's looking beyond this year. You've talked about it lengthening, going beyond 12 months of, of earnings to, to what's expected. And the expectation is that as bad as things might get this year, um, there is light at the end of the tunnel, although we can't see it. And so I, th I think it's explaining to, cl to clients, explaining to uh, anyone who will listen that uh, you, you don't want to get carried away with what the market's doing, but it, there is some justification uh, for the expectation that over time stocks are going to move higher and we use fixed income, continue to use fixed income to provide stability so people don't have to worry about all their entire portfolio going up and down. And Art, I think it's important to remember that as you look at kind of the expectations, you know, we're still in the midst of some of the worst data, as you say. And so I think, you know, you look at the, the study that came out today on remdesivir and important to note that it's a comparative analysis. It's not a clinical trial. It's not data that we would, we would think is scientifically rigorous, but it, it's important to note that the drug does seem to be helping slow the virus slow the rate of death with the virus. And it's those kinds of little things, you know, again, it wasn't a clinical trial, it's a comparative analysis, but it's those little data points along the way that are gonna help us to feel a little bit more comfortable that maybe we're not there yet, maybe the data can get a little worse, maybe the, the case counts can rise, uh, but every one of those data points is gonna help us understand that six months from now, a year from now, uh, things will look different than they look today. And that's encouragement, I think, for stock investors to continue to focus on 12 months from now, 18 months from now, than it is just simply looking at, you know, what case counts look like today. I thought it was really encouraging to read earlier in the week that uh, a partnership between Pfizer and a biotech company in Germany uh, thought that they were on the road to a vaccine, potentially could even be available by the end of the year. They thought they could have a billion, a billion doses by the end of next year. Um, that's probably the best news I, I read all week. Uh, they got a long way to go before they start marketing it, of course, and then manufacturing and distributing. Um, but there's no way economic activity gets back to normal until a vaccine arrives, um, which hopefully won't be that far into the future. You know, Kyle, this week, the Institute for Supply Management, as you know, offered their uh, issued their service sector report, uh, started to show that uh, um, demand started to stabilize, exports were starting to pick up. It's a first month over month expansion following two months of contraction. Um, we've been talking here on this program that growth could, of course, tail off um, after the initial rebound. But you know, to me, it's encouraging that uh, last week we saw the Institute of Supply Management manufacturing numbers go above 50. Folks, anything above 50 shows expansion, followed by this past Monday's release of the Institute of Supply Management service number also above 50. Um, so we're uh, nowhere near uh, the pre-pandemic economic levels, uh, but nevertheless, encouraging to see that we're, we're rebounding some. And the largest jump for service sector activity is since the data started in 1997. But I think a lot of that is a reflection of how bad it was in April and May. Uh, some of that certainly a reflection of things picking up, but you know, again, I think as you look at the comparison points, we're, we're talking about comparison points that are as bad as they've gotten. And so, um, you know, encouraging to see that we're beyond that 50 kind of, you know, fair watermark for uh, where, you know, uh, manufacturing is. And again, manufacturing historically had always been the piece we cared the most about because uh, for the longest time, our economy was built on industry. It was built on manufacturing. And we have certainly transitioned to more of a services-based economy. Uh, certainly transition to a lot of areas that I think are more impacted by services. And so encouraging to see that uh, that number followed suit this week with non, non or the uh, non-manufacturing index. And, you know, I think more importantly, you look at 
uh, kind of the path forward, a, a lot of those uh, businesses are going to be continued to impact by, uh, you know, what happens with these case counts. And so uh, if we can get a few months under our belt, even a couple of weeks under our belt where case counts stay low, you should see that services number continue to take higher. Kyle, you and I have been talking for months now uh, about the tale of two markets and reviewing uh, halfway through the year numbers end of June. Uh, the dispersion is getting somewhat extreme. Uh, many growth stocks are up more than 10% for the year. Microsoft up 35%, Apple up 30%. Many value stocks are down more than 10% for the year. 3M down 10 and a half, AT&T down 19, IBM down 10. iShares Russell 1000 value ETF right down 16%. Disney down 18, ConocoPhillips down 35. So the average for dispersion, folks, what we're talking about is the difference in percentage terms between the best asset class in the market and the worst. It's normally a little under 12% on average. Uh, but you, you're looking at a delta here of over 20% or more. Um, and you know where I'm going with this point is, the, the beauty of asset allocation is you need to gut it out in underperforming asset classes to really retain true balance. And the, the, the more extreme uh, dispersion gets, uh, the harder it is to practice asset allocation. Uh, but I can't think of a better time uh, to maintain the balance. Uh, it's just a matter of time, in my opinion, before they come up with a vaccine, just a matter of time before we get back to normal. And many of those distressed value stocks, uh, in my opinion, will do pretty well. But it's hard, you know, when you practice asset allocation and the difference between your winners and losers is uh, oftentimes almost 25 percent, it, it's sometimes hard to hang on there. Yeah, you know, Bob, I think investors are geared to just want to capture the best returns they can possibly capture. And uh, with a narrow focus, with a short term focus, that often means okay, what's the asset that's been doing the best? Because, um, you know, as I think most of us know, momentum's a pretty powerful force uh, in the short run. And so you look at what has done well, and uh, there's a lot of momentum there. The other, you know, important part about what has done well is that many of those companies, despite the pandemic, have been able to grow their earnings, while many of the companies that fall on the value side of the market have been very challenged earnings-wise. And so, and I think one of the things that has continued to support a lot of those growth names that we've been talking about is that they also have been able to grow their earnings. That just makes investors that much more attracted to them. But the reality is that long term, there's some good deals out there on the value side of the market. The reality is, you know, there's some businesses that are paying three and a half, four, five percent dividend yields even. And they're businesses with very solid cash flows. They're businesses with very solid balance sheets as well. And so, you know, if you're talking about bond yields, for example, where you're lucky if you can get 1% on really high quality bonds right now, and the flip side of that is you can buy a fairly conservative, good balance sheet, good cash flow stock, you know, some of the better utility stocks that are out there, for example, that are paying a 4 or 5% four or dividend even, you know, you've got a pretty solid income foundation. And if you're an investor that's looking at taking money from your portfolio, that's a great way to do it. And that's why, you know, I think Really interesting to see that huge diversion. Really interesting to see that, yeah, okay, we can continue to kind of overweight that side of the portfolio for a while longer because it does look like there's some legs there still. Uh, but I think longer term, you know, there's some reasons to think that value is going to come back even just a little bit from where it is. And that, that sets up pretty nicely, I think, for the balanced investor. Well, not as extreme if you look at the markets outside the United States give or take down 8% year to date, we're almost even. Um, and eventually, to me, that says there's opportunities overseas, but that could be a while yet. Art, as you know, that President signed the CARES Act in March, suspending the need to take required minimum withdrawals for the year. Uh, so I, I thought it was really encouraging that the IRS recently issued their notices 2020-50, 2020-51, that uh, makes it possible for almost everyone who had to take out a required minimum withdrawal for the year and didn't need the money, they can roll it back into their IRA from some limitations um, by the end of August. Uh, so <laughs> they didn't give people a lot of time to do this. 
so I think it's per, uh, you know it's worth repeating. Uh, most investors know that they don't have to take out required minimum withdrawals for the year, uh, but the IRS just at the end of June issued this notice uh, that says that um, if you qualify, most people do, you can roll it back into your IRA account by the end of August. Um, so I think it's good to spread that word. Yeah, I've been talking with clients uh, ever since that uh, memo came out, and we've been doing this on a regular basis. It's pretty simple. It's very easy to do. And if you want to see what the benefit is, take a look at your tax return from the prior year, take out the IRA distribution um, and see what your tax would have been. And it's very easy calculation that your investment advisor can go over with you or your tax return preparer can go over with you. And uh, it, it's tremendously beneficial. It's a one-time opportunity. And as Bob indicated, the door closes August 31st for money you've taken out, or at least it's uh, 60 days or August 31st is a standard rollover rule. So it's a tremendous benefit. And so for my clients who can afford not to take their distributions. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity that everyone should be definitely taking advantage of. Kyle, as we head into the elections this fall, and I'm starting to get more and more questions about the election, the impact on the markets. And, it, you know, it's deja vu all over again. I, I, this is my 45th year doing this professionally. And every four years, people are asking me, what if that other person gets in? Aren't we doomed? Um, and uh, so, you know, here we are, as Yogi Berra said, deja vu is coming back um, all over again. And um, it, I, I think it's important to talk about what drives stock prices. And I want people to misinterpret my remarks. I think it matters who's president. Uh, but frankly, for the stock market, it, it's not even in the top 10. Uh, what drives uh, the stock market, of course, is earnings um, and interest rates. The lower the rates are, the better it is for stocks and vice versa. Uh, and we're a nation of consumers. Uh, talking to a client of mine this morning who, who was very worried um, about what could happen in the fall, and, you know, explain to the person, think about buying a car. You go to the dealership, you're interested in getting your best price, you're interested in negotiating features, you're trying to figure out what color to get for your car. Um, and, you know, probably not even on your list is, you know, I wonder who's going to be the next president. Um, and, and people that are, are very closely attuned to politics uh, seem to think, uh, incorrectly that it's the be all to end all and it's not uh, the nation of consumers think about uh, going to the grocery stores thinking about redoing the deck out the back of your house thinking about adding on to the cottage uh, on, and on and on and on all the things that we do with our money and very few people think politically when they make purchases and that that's really the essence of understanding why uh, you know Politically, sure, all sorts of things matter. But when it comes to the stock market, it's, it's basically about interest rates and earnings. And politicians really can't do a whole lot about either one. I'm not telling you again that it doesn't matter who gets in, but I am telling you relative to managing money professionally, I think it's interesting when we talk to mutual fund managers as one example. I mean, they never talk politics. They never say, well, I'm going to do this, this, then this, and this, depending upon who gets in. Um, it's not even on the radar screen. So I find it so intriguing that individual investors think it matters way more than the pros think it matters. It is incredible, Bob, when you, when you talk to people and they find out what you do for a living, the first thing they want to do is say, oh, you must really support this candidate because of everything he or she has done for the markets, or you must really support this candidate because they you know, are doing this. And I think the reality is exactly what you're saying, and it's my favorite thing to point out to people. They don't make their decisions as a consumer based on who's in office. And so I think when you paint it in that light, it helps you refocus on what we care about, which is long-term, where is the opportunity? And, and again, I think it does matter who we elect. It matters to the economy. It matters to markets. Um, it doesn't matter as much as people want to emphasize that it does. And in particular, when you draw out 
uh, the impact of multiple elections over multiple years, which is what really should matter for investors, is not what the next year, two, three look like, especially for stock investors. I think what you wind up with uh, is that these things tend to level themselves out over time. We swing too far one way, we swing too far back the other, and eventually we come to rest where we're supposed to. And so, you know, I think if we focus on the direction that consumers are headed, if we focus on the opportunity, the rhetoric, especially the political rhetoric that drives a lot of the short-term volatility, uh, we, you know, we can start to see past that and really see to what matters. And that's where, you know, that the stories about, you know, buying a car, or, you know, I always like to tell people when you need a new fridge for your house, you don't make that decision based on who's in office, you make it based on when you need that new fridge. And so, you know, I think that's such a critically important thing to remember. You know, when you look at the markets halfway through the year, give or take, most people are up a percent or two, down a percent or two, or even. In the beginning of the year, I never would imagine it, right? Uh, by the third week in March, most people were down 15% or more. That by the end of June, you make all that back and you're basically even. So you look at your statements from the beginning of the year, you look at your statements as of the end of June, and looks pretty flat, um, which really hides the, the volatility that we've seen. Uh, so I think it's important for people just to stay balanced, uh, just avoid the temptation to want to do something in your account. Uh, occasionally it makes sense to trade, but uh, make sure you maintain that right balance. You know, finally, Max, um, I never heard more fireworks than I did this past weekend. It makes me proud of my neighborhood, uh, makes me proud of the country club across the river. Um, if I could find a publicly traded fireworks company, um, <laughs> I'd figure out how to take a position because um, just everybody decided with the pandemic, I'm going to make a bunch of noise. Um, they were gunshots. It just, well, I don't live in your neighborhood, Max. <laughs> we just blow up fireworks here. Um, but it was certainly impressive, and I want to encourage the trend. Um, it was just a whole lot of fun to celebrate the fourth um, in what was just an extended weekend of noise. There was a spectacular video shot from a drone of all the different uh, fireworks that were being sh shot off throughout southeastern Wisconsin. And it was, none of them were the spectacular July 4th fireworks that we're used to. But there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fireworks going up at the same time. It was pretty spectacular. Makes you proud to be a Milwaukeean. <laughs> well, folks, at the end of yet another Money Talk, we enjoyed doing the program. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, Email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com. <laughs> <laughs>